uh, most of you guys know, I'm Henry Park, co-founder and executive partner at Pando Blocks. I'll be your host and moderator for today. I promise this presentation will be short. I, uh, I, don't, I don't like tap dancing myself for too long. Um, and then we'll get into some curated Q&A until uh, about 30 minutes in, and then we'll get into general Q&A. So uh, I want to start with some quick introductions of the panelists. For the rest of the group, we'll save the introductions for the general Q&A section. And, and as we're going over uh, questions and comments, and I'll just uh, ask you to start with uh, you know, going over your, your background, the company uh, you're representing. But to kick things off, Pat, do you mind uh, starting with your background? Hi, everybody. Pat Turpin. I'm a kind of lifelong uh, CPG uh, executive and entrepreneur, was an executive at Costco and started a, a number of uh, new businesses for them, went on to start a snack food brand called Pop Chips. And after several other entrepreneurial ventures, um, all in food and beverage, I'm now a full-time board member and advisor to CPG companies, most of which are food and beverage companies. Thanks, Pat. Uh, Dayton? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dayton Miller. I'm a managing partner with Boulder Food Group, or BFG Partners, as we often go by. Uh, we're an early stage venture firm that typically uh, uh, invests in kind of Series A and food and beverage and other consumer packaged goods. And in, in that role, uh, I, um, I, I, I sit on boards um, and, and lead investments. Some of the brands that I'm currently involved with are Olipop, um, Kali Power, and Barnana. Awesome. And Darren? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Darren Kwan. I'm a serial entrepreneur, and I co-founded Data Central, which is the leading food service um, research and data business. Prior to that, I co-founded Menus.com. But a lot of the information that we aggregated and tools we built help uh, really impact CPG as well. Um, I've also started a call center business, Collective Solution, and I'm doing a new startup called Hoopla, which is an event discovery platform and short form video. So kind of like a TikTok meets event, but nice meeting you both. Awesome. Thanks, Darren. All right. So I'm going to uh, make this presentation short. Um, I'm, I'm going to zip past a lot of these uh, slides. So uh, don't worry if I'm going too fast. I'll, I'll email you guys the deck. And if you guys want to set up some more time to go over any of the details, would be happy to. A little bit on Pando Blocks. We're a provider of digital transformation services. A lot of consulting led by former CIO, CTOs, and COOs of companies like The Honest Company, Blizzard, Forever 21, Playboy, Pop Chips, United Talent Agency. But now we're building SaaS products for the CPG space. So the topic about ERP and, and, and the, the, the title of it, why ERP shouldn't be your first, uh, first enterprise application, you know, when we really dissected that, that problem, what we identified were the, the business issues as to why people are getting ERP. You know, the problem isn't the features of ERP. The problem is visibility. It's about really understanding the business. And so these are the uh, six main visibility points or seven main visibility points that we've identified to be the key initiator of wanting to get an ERP, right? Sales forecasting, inv inventory, projected cash, sales promotions, customer metrics, profitability, productivity. So, you know, what ends up happening is you know, when, when they realize they don't, that QuickBooks and, and basic solutions and Excel spreadsheet won't give them that uh, visibility, they start thinking, well, you know, what's the next thing is an ERP. And that's the instinctual next step for everyone, CFO, COOs, even IT, a lot of IT leaders, a lot of traditional IT leaders, they think that's the best solution, right? Because it, it's the bigger and better thing. They think it'll solve all their future problems as well. And vendors push it. So what a lot of people don't think through is the uh, four C's of ERP complexity. And after, after doing a lot of these ERP uh, implementations and fixes, these are the four that a lot of people don't realize they don't have to deal with this type of complexity, right? It's, it's the customization, you know, ERP, there's a ton of customization that go in, into an implementation. Um, there's a lot of change management. There's a lot of confusion around uh, processes. And then there's a lot of clutter around features, right? It's, it's a very, very feature-rich system. 
what a lot of people don't realize, and this is a Gartner statistic, is that 75% of ERP implementations fail for CPG companies and a lot of other industries, right? Um, and the reasons for it are here, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, lot of processes to, to, to implement, a lot of functions that aren't needed, uh, EDI, OMS, and WMS, you know, are, are typical uh, problems integrating, um, a lot of data management issues. So these are some well-publicized uh, ERP failures. There's huge soft costs and hardware costs. Some of our uh, consultants have had, uh, were, were uh, in living these implementations uh, to, to live and tell about. So what's the alternative? Well, there's this thing called data warehousing and BI solutions. And it's something that a lot of advanced CTOs and bigger companies know about and technology companies that are developing uh, software, obviously. Quick background on data warehousing is that it, it, it's a scalable solution to, to manage and organize large volumes of data. And, and you can put in front of it a BI solution, a business intelligence dashboard solution that'll give you the the reports and and the visuals that you need to really understand your business. These are some uh, examples of reports around forecasting, reporting metrics, uh, performance analytics, and and you can do this without implementing a really large enterprise application. The you know this is a, a slide we like to use in a lot of our uh, our pitches to to clients because uh, you know when you're focused on implementing a templated solution like an ERP, you, you end up being very myopically, myopically focused on certain parts of your business. And uh, it's when you really focus on the business goals, not system features, that's, that's when you really understand the business. And uh, implementing a data warehouse, you know, th that's how you have to look at it. So this is some of the benefits of a data warehouse BI solution is minimal disruption to your business. The reporting, financial reporting, you don't have to, you know, redo all your processes. You can use what you have right now. Uh, risk reduction, it, it's a lot easier to roll out, so less uh, uh, risk for implementation. It's easily scalable and integratable with future uh, systems. If you want to implement an ERP after this, it, it makes it a lot easier to implement an ERP and you can have a phased approach to your organizational change, right? It's a crawl, walk, run versus try, trying to do everything all at once. So after having fixed so many of these enterprise uh, digital transformations, what we've learned is that ERP salespeople, they, they won't tell their clients they're not ready for an ERP. Data hygiene and business processes are the main issues why the failures happen. Um, most CPGs, uh, uh, they get into ERP way too early. And, um, and in order to do it right, you got to really focus on data and processes, which is what data warehousing does. And all of these realizations is why we decided to uh, develop a, a data SaaS platform. All right, so zip through that. I want to get into, uh, I want to get into the Q&A. What, what I did was create four different topics for Q&A to go back and forth with the panelists. Um, and, and after that, uh, we'll open it up to more general questions from the group. Uh, but to kick things off, I want to start off with, uh, with Pat. The topic is around costs and considerations for ERP. As a co-founder of, of, uh, of Pop Chips and well-known brand, what are your, uh, some of your thoughts on the costs and considerations? Well, as far as considerations go, um, a lot of companies I've seen, at least as far as CPG manufacturers, um, somewhere around 30 to 50 million in revenue, you start to see the company outgrows its its systems of its system of QuickBooks and Excel. And they usually, you know, look at an ERP as, well, that's that's the only logical next step. The costs kind of range from 300 to 400,000 of what I typically see after customization, uh, which they usually don't tell you up front, um, but these are not plug and play systems and almost always require customization. That's yeah. typically what I've seen. Thanks for doing that a little backwards. Um, Dayton, as an active uh, investor, what are you observing with fast fast growth food and beverage companies you're investing in? 
Uh, well, I guess I'd, I'd say I'd kind of echo uh, the range that Pat was talking about. I'd say within our portfolio, uh, we have some folks more in the 90 to $100 million plus uh, revenue range that have been successful with ERP. Um, however, uh, it's required a, a full uh, on-site consultant uh, on the ERP side, as well as uh, somebody internally um, as well in order to, to do that. And, and, I, and I think the cost is actually more like a, a half a million bucks, so even a little bit north of what uh, Pat was saying. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we also have some uh, unsuccessful uh, implementations, and these, these are businesses that have been more in like the 10 to $20 million revenue range um, that uh, – in, introduce, and introduced ERP, you know, they, they just got some bad advice somewhere along the way. And uh, it, it really can can kind of smother a business that's uh, that 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 is that big. I mean, when, when you're only 10 to 20 million, you're fighting for survival every day, every week. And uh, uh, and, and, you know, by, by suddenly you have something that's really um, uh, hindering your access to information because you're in the middle of a transition. Um, it can be a, it can be a real nightmare, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, it's so resource intensive. Uh, these projects. Uh, the the second topic is around alternatives to ERP. And Dayton, I'll start with you uh, here first. Uh, what 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 are some of the alternatives you've seen um, in in your portfolio companies? Yeah, the the only thing you know, we don't get typically super involved at this level, uh, more from like a board level, but. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd say, as Pat mentioned, most companies are on QuickBooks uh, when they're starting. And then I think there's something called Fishbowl, which is either part of QuickBooks now or separate software from QuickBooks, but it's inventory management um, that, that kind of plugs in uh, into QuickBooks. I think there's um, a couple of others, but QuickBooks tends to be kind of the, the, the backbone. And then whether there's some type of like inventory software um, that's attached to it uh, is, is kind of the, 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 the fix. Yeah, and, and Fishbowl is a very popular product, and it's a it's a cloud based solution that we see a lot of co companies using too. And it, it's just it's just so much easier to implement and manage than doing it in your ERP. So there is it, it, there's definitely a growing trend to to go with that solution. Uh, Pat, what have you seen uh, 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 with some of your companies? Uh, very similar to what Dayton said, uh, inventory management tends to be. You, usually the first place they'll they'll start if they're going to implement something before ERP. And Fishbowl is a very popular um, example of that because it integrates into QuickBooks. But I would say that isn't plug and play either. And it has its own you know strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, yeah. And it, along with those solutions, uh, uh, QuickBooks, uh, uh, I know two years ago have been spending a lot of investment money on it. And a lot of the, the inventory... Uh, new features on QuickBooks is actually pretty robust too. Um, the third topic uh, I wanted to go over is uh, when do you when do you know you're ready for an ERP? And Pat, I want to direct this to you from an operating standpoint. Uh, you know, what are some of the things that you look for to see when a company is ready to implement an ERP? Usually, um, well, when a company starts feeling the need for an ERP is usually when it's outgrown its its scale and, and usually its complexity uh, has has grown to where it outstrips its ability to manage through QuickBooks and Excel. Um, but the problem is what you asked, Henry, when are they ready? And the companies rarely think about, are they organizationally ready for an ERP? Because an ERP requires all sorts of things from clean, consistent data fit into the system, but also fit in a particular way and in ways that usually mean a company has to change its processes. And if the company is immature in its processes, uh, they're gonna have difficulty implementing an ERP. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a people process first and then technology is, is, uh, is our mantra. Um, what, what do you think are some of the main sets of crucial data to running a CPG uh, successfully that you've seen, Pat? There's, you know, the obvious things people always think of, you know, your financial data, right? Um, but what usually kills most growth CPG companies that I've seen, um, and I'll be curious what what Dayton and Darren have seen, uh, but usually it it's it comes down to uh, cash flow, and that's because uh, it's obvi 
oftentimes tied to working capital swings. Um, the, from a data perspective, if they don't have quality forecasting by SKU, uh, inventory management that can then tie into production scheduling, as a result, they'll have too little inventory or, or be bloated. And when you're little, those swings are small potatoes and dollars. But as you scale and get bigger, those swings um, financially can be staggering and impact you know, cash flow and customer service levels. So I would say that. And then on top of that, if you're a manufacturer, I would add you know, data that sheds light on your true operating costs by SKU, because there's oftentimes a lot of hidden costs that if you're not tracking properly, your margins aren't what you think they are. Yeah, this is a uh, really good information. I'm sure uh, any any PE uh, uh, deal maker here on the buy side would be very familiar with what uh, what uh, Pat's talking about. Um, uh, Dayton, uh, uh, Darren, any anything you guys would like to add? I'll just say, like the inventory piece, that uh, you know, just to piggyback a bit on what, what Pat was saying. I think um, you know, the number of times uh, we've seen businesses. Increase, dramatically increase their complexity as they maybe scale from say 20 million to 40 million. Suddenly you have uh, different pack sizes, um, uh, different channels, and uh, and and then you're you're surprised because like your your books are maybe showing that you have a skew in stock, but like it's already pre-wrapped as part of the Costco bundle, and uh, it's just really really and then suddenly you can't convert that to cash, and so to to pass point you're 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 stuck. Um, uh, or you're scrambling, uh, maybe. So, um, yeah, the, the, the more insight and visibility you can have so you can match up your true demand with your true inventory, both finished goods and raw materials, uh, I think the, the better. It's certainly underappreciated early on. Awesome, awesome. And, and all of this data can be, uh, can be organized and presented with, uh, with a mobile app on a on a data warehouse BI solution, you know, it's just a lot easier to get this kind of intelligence in your business. The, the fourth topic uh, was around the importance of data for the future of food and beverage. And I know we covered some of the basics here with Pat and Dayton. But I wanted to advance the conversation here with, with, with Darren, uh, who's been in the space for a very, very long time. Uh, I think it was menus.com started what, 30 years ago? Yeah, 1999. 1999. Yeah, part of the first dot com bubble back in the days when we raised some money and uh, food.com, if people were familiar, raised like $100 million, which back in 99, that's gargantuan. Uh, and they blew all that money. Um, but we pivoted into creating Data Central and taking all that menu data, but really providing insights into food flavor and ingredient trends for the manufacturer community, which then has impacted the CPG community. And I, what I can say in dovetail a little bit is that because we work more with food manufacturers and restaurants, there's the parallels in that uh, recipe management and understanding your true cost of goods for each menu item is critical to understanding the profitability of that organization. But we also provided like front-end data, which is kind of what is trending and what's in demand. Because if you don't get those pieces right and you don't validate that with data, then again, you can be launching new uh, SKUs or flavors that aren't gonna be obviously hitting your customer, customer demands. And in the, in the case of the restaurant world, right? You know, that's millions and millions of dollars worth of supply chain management to get those menu items off the big chain menu. Um, so that's not dissimilar to whatever you have to do to get your products on the shelf of uh, grocery or retail. And so making sure that you're the right trend, the right time is really critical. So what, what you mentioned the front end data and you know, there's so much you could do in demand planning and, you know, not just from an inventory standpoint, but, you know, from, from a product uh, standpoint, um, what are you, how are you seeing the food and beverage industry uh, using the, the data that Data Essentials uh, creates? Well, again, a, a lot of what we were doing is focusing on food flavor ingredients and how those, uh, trend from let's say a high-end concept restaurants 
to casual dining to fast casual QSR that eventually led to CPG. But what we've seen is those time frames of when something comes up to retail is shortened. So imagine we all know like uh, salted caramel is a great combination, sweet and savory. We just kind of take that for granted. Now everything is salted caramel. But go back, you know, 12 years ago, that was just kind of more of an emerging trend. And so it takes time before it gets to this ubiquity. So I think staying as people in CPG, staying um, aware of the trends that are happening are going to be really critical for how you either formulate, design, and also market your food. Cool, cool. What, what are some interesting trends you've seen uh, from a consumer behavior with the data that you, you guys have been mining um, that's affecting manufacturing decisions in the food industry that's counterintuitive to what people would think? Yeah, great question. Um, well, there's a couple. You know, I think we're now in an age of minimalist ingredients. I was just sharing a story with Henry Pat and Dayton, like, do people here know who Mr. Beast is? He's like the leading YouTube person with 150 million followers. Yeah. So Grace, thumbs up because we have young kids. And what are young kids? They watch Mr. Beast and he launched Feastables, which is brilliant. It's a chocolate bar. But what he says on the video should make Hershey's quake because he's like, one, Hershey's is old school Feastables is cool. Why? Because we have four ingredients in our chocolate, only four ingredients in our chocolate bar. And Hershey's has nine. And I don't know what those other five are. They're probably, you know, for us or people in the manufacturing community, they're not big deals. But he's put into the, the psychology of our consumers today that less is more or more authentic. And so as a manufacturer, right, that's a challenge. How do you maintain quality and taste and flavor with less ingredients that are better for you. Um, some other ones are plant-based convenience. These seem kind of opposite, you know, people want these um, plant-based alternatives and there's a lifestyle around that, but yet it has to be convenient. And most, most of us know when it comes to convenience, that means packaging that's easy, cheap, and you throw away, which is also, counter to that um, lifestyle. So it makes it much more challenging in manufacturer to match your, your, your goods with the quality of packaging that people expect for that lifestyle. Now, I'll just say the last one maybe um, is this local and global fusion. The concept that we are continually being more, uh, more open as consumers to international flavors um, and we, we crave that discovery aspect, but yet we still have to manufacture these locally. So how do you make sure that you, again, maintain some authenticity, but with this global expansion? A vacation in every bite. There you go, yes. <laughs> and by the way, that's why I have a call center in Jamaica. Because when people talk to people in Jamaica, they think they're on vacation and it works well. Oh, oh wow. That's actually pretty cool marketing, yeah. Um, you know, as uh, Darren was talking about the minimalist ingredients, it just reminded me of, you know, some of the stuff that uh, uh, is a theme for what you're working on, Dayton. Is that is that part of the, the theme for uh, Boulder Food Group? Yeah, for sure. I think kind of fewer, simpler ingredients, more wholesome ingredients definitely is... Uh, is one trend where, where we believe the consumer is going. I think, um, you know, maybe one other, it kind of gets on the global flavors or global cuisine, but like um, that, that we also see are what we kind of call food tribes and, you know, nothing new, but, uh, but just like specialty diets, whether you're paleo, keto, vegan, uh, vegetarian, whatever it may be. And um, I think, uh, or, or you're just looking for more protein or, um uh whatever the the, the kind of uh, functionality you might be be seeking and so uh again what that leads to is skew complexity um and being able to uh, appropriately forecast and uh manage inventory levels for a lot of um very diehard uh groups so like if you know if you're hardcore paleo and, and you don't have a paleo product even if people love your brand they'll move over to a competitor um so it it, it matters 
Very cool. Very cool. Um, I had a question for you, Pat, on, on, uh, on this flow. As a food manufacturer, what kind of industry data do you use for trending and demand prediction? So if your product's being sold through brick and mortar retail, um, I use category, uh, third-party category sales data. Uh, these third parties are companies like IRI Spins or Nielsen and look for the nuances within my category. What do I mean by that? So for example, you could look at the cookie category and look at the data and it might show that nationally cookies are flat in growth. But then you look at maybe my subset is low sugar cookies and they might be up 40 or 50% year over year. So I use the data to see where, um, where it's growing. Um, also in terms of channels of trade, where it's growing, geography, and even in some cases by retailer. And then I'll compare that to the general industry trend research, you know, the consumer research, and, and use that to try to frame up what I think the macro demand would be for the, the next year or, or maybe two. Very cool. Very cool. Well, um, no, thank you for, for all the uh, information and sharing some of uh, the, the background on what you guys have been working on. I'm going to open it up to general Q&A. Before we get started, just a reminder, uh, if you can start with your uh, background of yourself and in just a minute about uh, what you're working on and what organization you represent, that'd be great. Um, uh, we haven't done a formal introduction at the beginning to save time for the Q&A. I, I had a question come up from Patrick, Patrick Kang. We had an interesting conversation yesterday about sell side data. Y y you want to go first? Yeah. So, um, well, first introductions, uh, I'm a VP at Intrepid, uh, focused on the food and beverage practice, um, uh, primarily focusing on sell side M&A um, and been focusing on the consumer sector for around 10 years. So uh, naturally being focused on transactions, um, you know, I think this conversation with regards to ERP, you know, we focus a lot on operational data and making business decisions, but it's also important in, you know, buyer diligence, invest investor diligence. So I guess the question is, you know, what is the thought process for businesses that, you're invested in or it's part of your portfolio and how does, you know, a potential near-term transaction affect your decisions about ERP decisions? Pat, did you want to uh, take a stab at this one? Sure. Um, given the issues that we just talked about on the complexity and, um, well, I'll just say the complexity and cost of implementing an ERP. If the companies that I'm working with are contemplating a transaction in the next year, uh, I say, you know, under pain of death, do not try to implement an ERP because it will, um, a lot of risk. It could, you know, Dayton said, said it perfectly. It's going to be all encompassing. It'll distract you from, from the business. And you could probably hobble by one way or the other for the next year. And then, you know, it'll, it'll become the buyer's problem. Um, if the time frame is longer, then it's a different conversation, right? Is, you know, how are we going to scale um, our systems and processes to keep up with that growth? And maybe we do need to implement something, whether it's an ERP or some of the other alternatives Henry was talking about. So time frame is, is, definitely uh, an important criteria from what I've seen. Yeah. Dayton, any thoughts? No, I, th I think that's spot on. I think um, uh, the, you know, in, in addition to kind of maybe requiring resources on the operations side, it also requires financial resources as well. And, um, and those are folks who are uh, supporting a transaction and making sure you're hitting your numbers and uh, things that are a lot more important and not to mention, if you're successful on the transaction side, then who knows whether the CRP is going to all the work that you're doing on the ERP side is even for anything, depending on whatever whatever system the acquirer is using. Um, so yeah, I, I, would, I would certainly agree with that. If it's in the next year, do whatever you can to hold off. Okay. 
Any other questions? Hi, this is Joseph. Oh yeah, hey Joseph. <laughs> oh, Thanks for that. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, you had mentioned. Oh, by the way, I'm Joseph Kim, managing director at Takanak Partners, uh, cross border M and A firm specializing in Japanese uh, cross border, uh, mainly on the buy side. Uh, you, had, you had mentioned earlier that um, to implement an ERP system, you're, you're talking about like a budget of five hundred thousand in customization. Um, on the de on our deck, or was it the one of the panelists? I think it's one of the panelists was saying. Yeah, that, that's, that's um, what I've seen. Something in that range. And is 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 that an, a capitalized cost? I mean, or we were talking about a SaaS model, uh, and I, I would think that benefit of that is, is spreading the cost over you know a monthly basis or you know a subscription basis rather than an upfront cost and just trying to figure out how that impacts the valuation in terms of EBITDA versus capex if that, if that's even a, a consideration or not um for these companies uh and also just from an integration standpoint from a buyer's perspective you know uh is is an ERP system really a a selling point or not? Um, I mean, you know, like you, I think you, there were some discussions that some buyers you just hold off on it because you, maybe the buyer itself has a better ERP system and you just spend all this time and effort to implement it and then you have to change it again. So, um, I, I guess there's just a, a load of questions that. I, some of the yeah. things that we come across when we look at it from a Japanese standpoint, you know, because uh, Japanese don't necessarily have a great ERP system uh, in some cases, um, but they're always looking for technology and trying to get some know-how from um, from the U.S. partner that, that they're looking to acquire. In in the specific example that I was referring to, uh, gosh, there's nine production facilities all throughout the U.S., 35 SKUs sold across 40,000 retail doors. Uh, and we were having a lot of trouble with our old system, which was QuickBooks, uh, figuring out profitability by customer, profitability by product. Um, you know, are we kind of attributing the right true cogs and uh, fully loading them to get a contribution margin by customer? Uh, so it, it was coming with like pretty significant cost. Um, and the, but it was still a, still a major undertaking. We ran parallel systems for a couple of months. Um, I think it was even like a full quarter just to make sure everything was kind of being, being tracked correctly. So going back to past point, the last thing you want to be doing is kind of duplicating all of that work in the middle of a transaction. Um, you know, I, I guess it really just comes down to kind of what the needs are of the business and whether those are being appropriate or are, are, are giving appropriate visibility into the, the needs of properly managed business. And Dayton, a uh, follow-on to that is from an M&A perspective, do you, did your portfolio company get to view that as an add back to EBITDA because it's a non-recurring, you know, one-time cost? Uh, great question. I would think so. Um, you know, the, the, we, we always show because like adjusted EBITDA is like so, <laughs> such a, you know, Community adjusted EBITDA in the, in the case that we work, um, uh, but uh, but so yeah, so probably um, you know, they they weren't doing a transaction at the time, so uh, it wasn't like a huge huge deal. But um, but yeah, certainly one time non recurring, uh, you know, just like any other kind of deal related expense, presumably. Yeah. Oh, well, one of the things I'd uh, I'll add to that, Joseph, because in the in the U.S. ERP man, it, it's a big cost, and so. When we when we calculate what the estimated cost is, we're using a SaaS uh, based ERP. Uh, NetSuite is typical, typically very popular here in the in the U.S. for companies of this size, and it's a cloud SaaS based uh, solution. And uh, uh, the numbers we use to compare our product is three hundred thousand uh, for the cost of implementing NetSuite for a company of, of around hundred employees, um, and, and that three hundred thousand dollars breaks down into about $150,000 for uh, ongoing yearly subscription costs. So it's, it's, it's roughly around $14,000 um, a month in, in licensing fees from, from NetSuite. And, and we used a conservative number estimating 300,000, uh, uh, Dayton uh, you know, threw out $500,000. But the reason we, uh, uh, we, I say it's conservative is 
typically what we see is two, 2x the uh, licensing uh, subscription cost for the year as customization and implementation costs. So, you know, if, if a company is spending $150,000 on yearly subscription for NetSuite, typically the first year cost for implementation, and it takes like a year uh, uh, to implement depending on your environment. Mr. Meyer over here, he could he could share your, his experience. He, he actually got it done a lot quicker, but um, but typically it's uh, uh, around uh, 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 3X, uh, uh, 2X the cost of the, the, um, the subscription. So if you're spending $150,000 on, on yearly subscription, it's about $300,000 to actually implement it. Is and that's just first year costs. Yeah. But it, it was there uh, anything because uh, was there anything else to this that you you want to get deeper into, Joe? No, I I think it was covered. I, I was. It is interesting about the EBITDA adjustments. Uh, it is you know whether you capitalize these costs or it's ongoing it's viewed as an ongoing maintenance or ex, you know operating expense. Uh, probably another. Discussion. And probably the other thing is, you know, we were talking about this ERP and it, it, is the company ready for it or not. Um, but my understanding was sometimes we I had dealt with a client that says they had to put an ERP system because their customers were asking for it. And, you know, I mean, yeah, what's, you know, and then do you have to select the ERP system that, that the customer is asking for? Like you were talking about Costco, you know, if, if you know, if Costco is requiring, certain type of information that you know your QuickBooks is, is able to generate you know maybe that's one of the things you have to consider which which ERC system will be more compatible with Costco's systems yeah. and stuff yeah yeah and and uh, uh Pat I don't know if you have any input on this but from from the technology side you know the, the way we would handle that is by really understanding what the needs are uh, from from uh, the customer, and if we're talking Costco or Walmart, typically it's not the ERP; it's some sort of EDI process, you know, it, some it, some integration uh, in sending information back and forth, and you know, some sort of compliant model. And you know, ERP actually does that really, really poorly. Um, and so, you know, it, it really depends on the customer and what they're looking for. But, you know, we would really start by understanding the business uh, needs and it, it'll all report to some sort of end up in some sort of report and format with the data. But, Pat, uh, did you have any insight? Into yeah, I, I used to work for Costco. They they would they would never for, you know, force somebody into an ERP or um or, or get that involved in, in a client's business or a supplier's business, I should say. Um, I've never heard in general of, of customers, you know, demanding ERPs be in place for a manufacturer, but um, uh, to, to Henry's point, EDI is the thing you often hear that's forced upon the, the manufacturer from the customer and they may have certain EDI requirements, but, but in the scale of complexity, EDI is pretty, pretty straightforward and much easier to implement. Yeah. All right. Um, Luigi, you had a question. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, Luigi Bordenaro, many decades in operation. You can tell by my hairline. <laughs> uh, most of it was spent on the entertainment side uh, with Playboy. I was there for 20 years. And, and but before that, some restaurant and food stuff as well. Um, it's funny because we were just talking about costs and, 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 and I think before that we were talking about time, you know, and, and just the scale and everything, but the, you, you know, Henry had that one slide, the, the four C's, I think the change management thing, um, mm -hmm. curious to hear from the panel, just cause I, you know, I'm trying to envision a, a small company, you know, CPG or other, you know, 15, 20, 30 employees, you know, growing and, you know, some of the people probably staying late, working weekends, and now you're going to come to them and go, uh, yeah, on top of everything you're doing, we also need you to, you know, give input into, you know, due diligence process to create new workflows um, that are probably going to put you out of a job once you're <laughs> I can just imagine just from a morale perspective and a, and a, just a, a resource sink, 
you know, the, the bigger the scale of what you're trying to do might derail you when your company's at a very critical point, right? And I don't know if, if any of the panelists had experience with that of how maybe it went right or maybe how it went wrong, where it just, you know, you thought you were doing well and there was sort of a, you know, a two-year window, but it just crashed and burned maybe. Sorry, Luigi, when you say it crashed and burned, do you mean the ERP implementation or something? Yeah, different? either either one, either the ERP failed because, you know, because of that change management aspect where you couldn't get people to stop what they were doing and give proper feedback um, or, um, you know, or the, the positive side was, you know, you didn't go the ERP route and you did, you know, you, you needed a hammer. So you just went and bought a hammer. You didn't buy the. 50 tool kit hoping that someday down the road we're going to use those 48 tools you know yeah well i i'd like to open up that uh that uh, uh question to not just erp but any any system right that uh -huh. that gets implemented this way and, and one of the uh things that uh, uh we like to 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 talk about a lot in our engagements um before we get started um is uh when it comes to technology it unless unless you're if you're building a, a software platform, it's a completely different story. But if what you're doing is implementing some sort of technology into your business, it's 25% technology and it's 75% organizational change management. It's a lot of heavy business lifting and, and changing processes and whatnot. And, and, you know, I don't think it matters whether it's ERP or some sort of inventory system or whatnot. But, you know, if anyone here has some, some, you know, stories. So I think Luigi's looking for some some nightmare scenarios. Maybe we don't have to talk about the actual company, but anything that you guys have seen where, you know, just the, yeah, you, you thought that the implementation would go smoothly, but then it just, it, it just completely threw off operations, right? Because a lot of these implementations are being done while you're operating. You know, it, I like to use an analogy of, of, you're actually, you know, changing out the engine while you're going, you know, at, at 50 miles an hour on, on the freeway, right? And, and you know, have you, have you, what have you observed as, as these operational, you know, havocs that, by, by trying to implement something? Uh, I'll give you a quick story. Um, <laughs> back, back in uh, when I worked at Costco, um, we had some vertically integrated manufacturing businesses that made private level products for Costco and. And the, the one I was responsible for, our corporate IT department, now keep in mind, this is an IT department for a retailer, not a manufacturer, uh, makes the decision for us, they're gonna implement this, this system and it's gonna be wonderful. And there was no involvement on our part. They jammed it in and it was such a failure. We literally couldn't ship product. Um, and for the scale and size of that retailer, that was highly disruptive. <laughs> um, that was probably the worst example I've seen, but unfortunately I've seen dozens of examples where the C-suite makes a decision, they jam in an ERP, uh, the organizational change management part that Henry's talking about is not taken into account. And it either fails to the point where they give up or more often they, they, they have a partial implementation and they just can't utilize major modules of the ERP. And they tend to be the ones with the most value. Um, and it tends to be the minority of companies that actually do it the way Henry described. And it's usually because those particular um, operators have been through it before and know they have to go through that process before they implement anything. But that that's the minority of the operators I've seen. I don't know what uh, Dayton and Darren have seen. Uh, I was just going to tell a really quick story. It's a uh, non-food. It's a major um, fashion retailer, fast fashion retailer. Um, and they were growing so fast and they implemented the NetSuite and they had complications. But their way of handling that was that they, they got so many poor customer service um, calls that they couldn't handle. They just turned off their phones. So when they come to hire me or brought me in to look at their customer service and how we can help them, first I went on the Better Business Bureau to check out this company and it had a one star 
And I'm like, oh my goodness. And all these reviews were like, this place is a scam. They don't call me back. They take my money. I don't hear anything. So I was really worried because I'm like, I have no idea if this is a real place or not. So I did my pitch meeting, went really well. I could see they had agents there. Um, but I told the CEO, I said, hey, can I just go see your warehouse? Like, I just, I'm really interested in logistics. And it was really so I could just validate that this was a real business. This is how bad the customer's uh, responses were. And he opened up the door and it looked like the warehouse from Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? All those huge boxes and shelves. I'm like, holy cow, this is a real business. They just had problems with their software systems communicating with a customer service and they didn't know how to handle it. And that company is Fashion Nova. So, um, you know. yeah, uh, process and pe pe people in process, man. It's yeah. typically what the problem is. And, and w when you really isolate that, it becomes an easier problem, but you need to put some forethought into it before, yeah, before implementing it. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing that. that that uh, example both of you um the, the one other thing uh that we've seen is uh <laughs> we found more erp implementations that we'd have to fix that was designed to look like their finance system <laughs> like they'll implement a netsuite and it'll look just like their quickbooks like and and the processes and workflows and reports are like just really similar to it and it's like we ask them why'd you do that why why don't you just keep QuickBooks then? And the answer is always, you know, well, we thought we had to, like, you know, and and it's funny because if you, when you look at the system requirements that they use to implement uh, NetSuite or the ERP, it's they, they, it's designed just like QuickBooks. Their answers because it's the answers are always feature based. You know, hey, how do you want to design this feature? Do you want to fit turn this feature on? You know. And, and, and when you flip that conversation and go, okay, what do you need from a business standpoint? It changes things. And, and um, the, I did want to get back to Patrick. You had a question for the group, but now I have a question for you being on the sales side, uh, 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 deal-making for CPG. What, what data do you see that CPG companies do not have readily available that that hinders the deal that you think can be resolved by e, by an ERP like there's a maturity in the in the in the CPG operation where you know you would like to see certain types of sales data you know organize a certain mm -hmm. way or whatnot and then they can't provide that kind of what do you what are you seeing out there so most of the re requests that we get around things like sales, you know, gross margin by channel, um, by top customer, by product skew and category. Um, you know, I think there have been instances in the past, like for instance, this one business um, that I was working with, um, they're a manufacturer of ingredients. So they have a ton of SKUs, um, you know, a ton of different varieties, different customers, different channels. Um, but in this particular instance, this is an example where the ERP system had trouble kind of marrying their actual costs with what the business was actually experiencing. Um, so like for, like in this example, the company, they use standard costing, but the ERP had a tough time trying to marry the standard costing with, you know, what the, the business is actually experiencing. So, you know, when we share this information or the investors inquire about it, it's actually not very substantial or it doesn't say much because it's not really true insights on what the actual margins of the business are. So I think this was, you know, experience I had where, you know, you have to kind of think about is the ERP achieving what we need from a insights and business decision-making perspective and you know, that has a kind of cascading effect into, is this what our shareholders, investors um, require? Or is it, you know, is it insightful enough or is it worth investment? Because I, I do remember um, this flavoring business spending a lot of money and they had a ton of headaches trying to get real insights from the from the system. So, but, you know, the like things like channel, top customer, SKU, category, sales and margin, um, these are all pretty standard stuff that people ask for. And 
in some instances, uh, some investors won't even look at a business if they know that there are system limitations for you know business that they're reviewing. So um, all pretty important for for evaluating something. Very cool. Very cool. Hey, Harold, thanks for joining. You're you're a, a general counsel. What are your, what are your thoughts on any of this? Any questions come come to mind? Uh, not questions, but I, I've definitely seen these pain points live um, in person. When I was at GT's Kombucha, uh, the company was at a stage where it really wanted to take the big step forward in, in terms of becoming a more sophisticated organization. And the ERP implementation was extremely chaotic, very labor intensive, meaning we were just not ready. And, um, you know, we got essentially seduced by some good salespeople. Um, who didn't really assess what the true needs are and how long this would really take. So it was a huge drain on the organization. And and in the end, um, what we got out of it probably wasn't equal to what we put in for the implementation. So, yeah, I, I, feel, I feel the pain of everything that we've discussed. Yeah. I always say if I, if I could wave a magic wand and change the rules that ERP salespeople are compensated off successful implementations as opposed to sales... <laughs> there'd be a lot less of these stories. <laughs> it's a great idea. That's our goal. That's our goal. I, I think that about does it. Uh, it's 12.56. I think we could have uh, four minutes to, to get back and get ready for the rest of the day. Really appreciate everyone coming in. I'll send a copy of this deck to everyone. And if, if there's any further questions for the panelists that you guys have, I'll happily connect you guys. Uh, just let me know. And uh, obviously, if you guys are interested in a data warehouse solution, please please uh, uh, think of Pando Blocks. Would would love to talk further. Um, we're gonna uh, uh, think of a next series for this, and 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 uh, we would love to invite you guys back. We'll have uh, a, a webinar about the best practices for CPG coming up next. And so, um, yeah, let's make this a, a regular thing, and we'll keep you guys abreast of everything that's going on new year. But thank you everyone for coming by and uh, spending time with us.